Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, you know, it just sucks. I mean, I understand that I'm not supposed to expect cold weather in Florida. I get that. But by the same token, I'm, I'm supposed to expect better weather than we're getting. I mean, it is humid and even if it's not hot right now, it's kind of nasty and kind of moist and there's fog in the air. I was driving through fog this morning. Uh, you know, all the cars are covered with uh, condensation and it's just not what I want at all. I'm expecting, you know, mornings at least in the mid 60s and then afternoons in the low 80s, maybe the high 70s. I'm not asking for much, long story short, and uh, I'm just not getting it, and I think that absolutely sucks. Uh, you know, it's probably 75 right now, maybe 73. It's not terrible, but by 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, it's going to be crappy, hot, and miserable. Uh, certainly not up to July standards, I wouldn't argue that, but, you know, for mid-December, it's just unacceptable and uh, I'm having a pretty crappy season so far so uh, you know I looked at the weather report it's going to be like this for the foreseeable future I'm going to keep my eye on it and hopefully something changes but uh, for the moment it looks like we're stuck in this rut and uh, it doesn't have me in a very happy frame of mind uh, animals have been at an absolute minimum not a deer not an armadillo not even one of Peter's angry weird cats this morning just absolutely nothing. Uh, I saw a bird when I pulled in. He was sitting by that tree up there, uh, but he seems to have vanished. I don't hear them. Uh, it's quiet, maybe too quiet. Uh, possibly all the little woodland animals have gathered in a sphere somewhere and they're plotting an attack. We'll see. I, I don't think so, but uh, you never know. Uh, either way, I'm going to keep a wary eye out for that. And we're going to dive directly into this car. <laughs> I know I say that every time and then I roll off, but we are. We're going to get right into this car. Well, I, okay, I've done it. I, I will say we have more cars coming up. I've been on a buying spree. I'm absolutely loaded up with cars. Half of them need shit done to them before I can get them ready and up. The other half just need to get ready. And uh, hopefully I can keep the ball rolling on videos and keep things going. But we'll see. Anyway, you know, who knows? It's it's tough times getting cars through the shop and up and out. And, and uh, you know, I'm doing the best I can to get these things rolling. But it's slow going. And that's why you haven't seen a ton of videos day after day. But with any luck, that's going to change. Uh, what we have today is a 1973 Cougar XR7. Uh, 73, arguably the last year of the non-Malaise car. Some people would say 74 was it. I wouldn't argue with them. Some people say 73. Uh, certainly the signs of Malaise were creeping in at this point. Uh, but for the most part, cars were still being made like they were when, you know, there were no holds barred. Uh, there were just a few little things happening that sort of was, you know, ushering in this new era, but uh, it wasn't quite here yet. Uh, this is a second generation Cougar, which was an incredibly important car for Mercury. I mean, they fought to get it. Uh, you know, the Mustang came out in 60, well, almost 64 and a half. Mercury wanted one for themselves. They wanted a version of it. They finally got it. Uh, it came out in 1967. They called it the Cougar, and it was an instant sales success, even better than anyone predicted. I mean, it instantly accounted for like almost half of, uh, you know, the Lincoln Mercury division sales. I mean, it was a very, very big deal at the time and, uh, and sold a lot of cars and uh, even had to, you know, they upped production. They opened it another plant in California and uh, you know they, they really got these things rolling and they sold a bunch of them and with good reason uh, the first generation Cougar was absolutely stunning I mean it was a gorgeous car uh, it was marketed as kind of a euro looking thing for Americans and you know panache and you know sophisticated gentlemen and, and that really did actually work pretty well in fact um uh, one of them, well, I'll get into that in a minute, but look, it was a big deal. And Cougar, the name, would go on to 
be the definitive marketing pitch of the entire Mercury division. I mean, every time you'd see a Mercury dealer sign, there'd be some big cat draped over the top of it. You know, the, they ended up naming other cars after cats to sort of keep the theme going. Uh, they had these sultry ads with supermodels and, you know, Farrah Fawcett and Cheryl Teagues with cougars, you know, prancing around them. I mean, it just became the definitive identity of the Mercury division and uh, frankly that just kept going all the way through the 1980s until Cougar and Person and Luxury Coupe sort of lost the vibe to SUVs so it was a pretty big deal. Uh, it was marketed at least for these first two generations as an upscale pony car uh, which is what the Mustang was you know not quite a mid-size not quite a muscle car it was a pony car though you know it's interchangeable some of the pony cars were muscle cars and Anyway, we're not going to get into all that minutia, uh, but long story short, it was meant to be a pony car, and it was. Um, and this one here is a bit of a rare setup, which is why I bought it and why I have it here. Uh, when I saw it um, listed, I went after it. Uh, it's um, It's got the Q code, they call it. You know, Ford is big into this code, that code. Uh, basically, that's a letter in the VIN number which denotes what engine the car had. And uh, in 1973, this Q code stood for the 351 Cleveland Cobra Jet uh, CJ engine, which was the hottest setup you could get in 73. Uh, that was pretty rare, but even more rare was that this one has the four speed in it, and uh, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, how rare is it? Uh, in 73, they made 60,000 Cougars, roughly. Uh, the, the pretty good number, actually, because again, this was a pretty good sales success for them. Uh, of those, 35,000 were XR7 hardtops, like this one, uh, which uh, I looked up XR7. I tried to figure out what it meant, what it stood for. And there's a lot of people out there saying XR is experimental racing. I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, they say 7, it was the T7 body or something. That could be true. Uh, other people say the 7 was the number they used in a Le Mans car. I don't think that's true, even if it is true. And uh, I don't know. I think XR7 might just be something they pulled out of their asses. To, it sounded cool. And uh, I think that's probably exactly what happened. But uh, anyway, 35,110 to be exact, were XR7 hardtops. Uh, of those, only 2,485 came with this 351 Cleveland, uh, which maybe it's a big block, maybe it isn't. We'll get into that when we do the engine thing. But either way, it was a pretty hot motor, and only a small percentage of these cars came with it. Of those, only 260 had the four-speed. So we're talking already about one in 260 cars out of about uh, 60,000 Cougars that were made. So uh, then you get into like AC and a tape deck and the quarter top or the three quarter top in this car and uh, the number gets even smaller. So this right here is a pretty rare beast and uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll get into that as we go. Um, but the Cougar model was wildly successful for Mercury right off the bat. I mean, initially, immediately it was just successful. Uh, and of, of course it did set the trend for their marketing, TV advertising, you know, join the cat set, all of that stuff for the next 30 years or so. Uh, certainly the next 20 years. They were very, very hip. Uh, there was even a cougar in the 1969 James Bond movie, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, identified by name by James Bond, you know, uh, is the woman driving the cougar here, you know, he asked. And uh, there was this sort of uh, blood red cougar running around the Swiss Alps that was very, very cool and uh, featured actually quite heavily in the movie. So uh, Cougar was a pretty big deal at the time. I mean, shit doesn't just show up in James Bond movies by accident. You know, it's either uh, paid for marketing or it represents something that's pretty hip and cool at the time. And uh, I suspect the Cougar in this car may have been both. Uh, but it was up, you know, it, it just absolutely hit the target perfectly. And, and from out of nowhere, I mean, it really, there's no cougar in automotive history before 67. It was just something that was all done by the marketing department and uh, of that it became a little bit of an American institution. 
So anyway, there's that. But look, let's get into 1973 for a minute. And, you know, one of these days I'm going to run out of the ability to do these little years in review because we've done most of them. So it's it's always a treat when I get a year that I haven't done. But uh, 73 was, eh, was what it was. Uh, it was a pretty big year. You had the Paris Peace Accords. Uh, they, they were signed after all kinds of shuttle diplomacy by Henry Kissinger and Nixon. And uh, it brought the uh, U.S. involvement in Vietnam to a close and created a framework for withdrawal, which, of course, went very badly, uh, as we were reminded of lately, and uh, the unification of Vietnam. I actually have a theory that the uh, the angry hippie types, all of a sudden, everything they wanted, they had. We're out of Vietnam. You know, what the hell did they do? Uh, they didn't have a clue. And I think that led directly to disco and uh, possibly roller skating or, God forbid, uh, both together. Um, you know, obviously, after they got what they wanted, they just... The 70s became what it was. Uh, OPEC, uh, it decreased the flow of oil to countries that supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War, so all of that shit was still going on. Uh, that immediately led to a recession in Europe, uh, certainly in England, uh, and it led to another gas crisis here where prices went up by like 200%, not unlike now, mind you, and uh, it created um, all kinds of problems for people. Uh, it also led to the passing of a bill for um, the Alaska oil pipeline that was going to be built, which was a great idea because we all know that pipelines and domestic oil production really help out the middle guy. You know, he doesn't have to pay as much for heating oil and gas at the pump. I mean, a country would have to be friggin' insane uh, to not build pipelines. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, Secretariat won the Triple Crown. By all accounts, it was a very fine horse, although I wouldn't want to be within 100 feet of it. Uh, American Graffiti was at the box office. Uh, that's a movie that's very car-centric, and it's considered something of an historical record of the time, uh, even being preserved by the Library of Congress. And if you're a car guy, uh, it's definitely worth seeing that if you have it. If you're kind of one of these young snowflake guys looking for stuff to watch, uh, look up American Graffiti. You'll find it kind of prescient and interesting, uh, you know, compared to modern times. And, and it'll give you a little baseline, even if that little prick Richard Dreyfus is in it, who I can't stand. Uh, Vice President uh, Spiro Agnew, he resigned in disgrace over a bribery scandal or some other crap. Uh, he was going to be replaced by uh, Gerald Ford. And then less than a year later, Richard Nixon, who wanted us all to know he wasn't a crook, uh, resigned over the Watergate stuff. So all of that was going on. Uh, it, one of the more interesting cultural events in 73 was the Battle of the Sexes. Uh, it was a tennis match. Uh, and it put uh, Billie Jean King up against some lady whose name I don't remember uh, at the moment. Um, he won the match easily and assured the dominance of men or confirmed it uh, in sport for at least another 20 years. And of course, now that's all up in the air again. Now men are dominating women's sports, so it's a totally different thing. But uh, kudos to Billie Jean King for standing up for our gender. Uh, in the movies, you had The Exorcist, you had Deliverance, you had Live and Let Die, uh, the Sting, uh, TV had Columbo, The Odd Couple, MASH, The Walton, Sanford and Son, uh, Music, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, Pink Floyd, Elton John, The Eagles, and uh, ABBA started creeping in, speaking of that 70s disco crap, so... Anyway, all in all, a pretty solid year and a pretty interesting year. And, uh, you know, it went on to, um, eh, who knows, uh, you know, America became different after that. Uh, but let's get back to the car. Uh, and and he, this is a second generation Cougar, still a pony car, even though it's definitely stretched out. And it still shares a platform with the Mustang, which was, of course, also bigger for 71 through 73. Uh, although it still rode on the same basic platform that the original Cougar and Mustang did, which was based on the unibody from the uh, Ford Falcon. Uh, although it did have a lot of upgrades to make it a little more... I don't know, you know, a little more substantial in terms of handling and road manners and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, the Falcon would have needed a little bit of work to become posh, which it got. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, the Cougar was well on its way to becoming a bigger softer, less powerful person or luxury coupe, but that wouldn't happen in earnest until the next gen, the third gen, uh, when it went away from them. There are the birds. There they are. 
little bastards. Uh, more of them, anyway. Uh, that wouldn't happen until it uh, ditched the Mustang the next year. I think it started sharing a uh, uh, frame with the Gran Torino until it eventually went on to, uh, well, the Mustang then changed. I said the Mustang, the Thunderbird it started sharing with. But in this second gen, it was still basically a pony car in a dinner jacket, you know, a dressed up version of the Ford Mustang for people who wanted a little bit more panache. And uh, even in 73, they lengthened the front end for crash protection stuff, federal regulations, the five mile an hour bumpers came in. Uh, you see they're a bit extended. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think the looks are very, very striking. And even if it shared the roof line almost exactly with the Mustang, uh, they did uh, differentiate it in other ways. Uh, you know, the Mustang had a very, I won't call it a banal front end, but far less complex than this. They wanted this Mercury Cougar to share uh, the looks of other Mercuries and the Thunderbird. And this looks a lot more like a Thunderbird in the front than the Mustang did. Uh, you've got four uh, round horizontal headlights. You've got split grill. Uh, you got a little waterfall grill in the middle with the XR7 badge. You got some bumperettes there and uh, very much a protruding, uh, protruding, I like that, protruding bumper. Uh, down the sides, it's, eh, I won't call it minimalist, but it's not overwrought. I mean, you've got chrome or uh, aluminum trim around the wheel wells. You've got some rocker panel trim. Uh, I suspect these are aftermarket alloys, although I, I really, I mean, man, aftermarket wheels are always a negative for me, or almost always. And on this car, I really had to look at them and think about them and make sure they weren't some kind of refreshed originals that the car might have come. I'm sure some Ford guys out there think I'm nuts for saying that. But uh, when I look at these things, I think they look pretty damn good and fit the car very, very well. Uh, I suspect they're also from one of these... Um, uh, companies that uh, specializes in Cougar restorations because they just, you know, they just work on the car more than most aftermarket wheels would. Uh, you got Cougar badging on the fender. You've got a fixed uh, antenna there. You've got uh, uh, raised up cowl in the back hiding the wipers. You've got uh, alumachrome around the front windshield. You've got that, yeah, I think, pretty attractive three-quarter vinyl roof. Mustangs also had vinyl roofs, but not quite as ornate as the ones you could get on the Mercury. Uh, you've got bulleted sport mirrors. You've got sunken door handles, which look nice. Uh, these were still the ages of the uh, open top coupe, so you have the front and rear windows could roll down, leaving the whole side uh, wide open, which I think looks really neat. Uh, you got nice big haunches on the um, on the rear quarters, almost you know like a cat's haunches or something, I suppose one could say. Uh, and you've got this fascinating flying buttress look here in the back. Uh, with the uh, roof line extending all the way towards the rear of the deck lid. Uh, very reminiscent, mind you, of the Jaguar XJS, which this predates. It makes me wonder if uh, uh, Jaguar didn't get a little bit of inspiration from the Mustang and the uh, Cougar, but uh, I think it looks terrific, and I like the way it then sinks into this uh, it taillights in the bumper thing with the twice pipes beneath it that uh, hearken to other Mercury's. Also, frankly, has a little bit of a Dodge look to me. Uh, you know, that came out a bit later on. So, you know, I give Mercury credit for leading the way. Uh, you also have the Cougar script in the back with the XR7 logo. Neat stuff. And uh, everything looking pretty damn cool. I really have to say, this is just... <laughs> Really good looking 73 Cougar. Uh, I think black really suits it and uh, makes it look a little bit sinister. So, anyway, look, there it is. There's the outside of the car. I'm going to pause for a couple of minutes and uh, then we're going to get into the trunk, under the hood, into the interior, and go for a drive. So, bear with me for one minute. All right, we're back. So, actually, fairly interesting that it's such a short generation this one 71 through 73 uh, basically three model years which isn't an yeah you know, it's not a whole lot and was a complete restyle for 74 so uh, it's not like they continued so it means that either the changing standards and emissions and safety stuff you know got in the way of the car or this was just a holdover until they could do what they wanted to do with it and uh, I think a three-year only car makes it uh, kind of interesting for collectors uh, but let's see what we got here so uh, in that big beautiful chrome bumper which I like it does have a flip down gas door as was the uh, style at the time uh, we've got the two key system 
nice and then we've got a nice big proper trunk uh, you know there's not really much you can say about it it's a nice big trunk uh, you know you can fit all kinds of crap in here not going to be a problem uh, whatever you need to take with you is going to be just fine uh, nowhere to tie down toddlers so if you throw them back in here they're kind of on their own they're going to have to fend for themselves I also don't see a spare tire anywhere so uh, I don't know if that's um, <laughs> That's by design, or if it's an oversight, I don't think there's one under there. So probably the car is just missing a spare tire, uh, which uh, means we're just going to have to get one. Thank you, Dalton, for telling me that. Uh, but anyway, there it all is, and looking good in there, and uh, even the light's still working. We got the jack instructions, and you know everything uh, nice and proper in the. Uh, rather boring trunk but uh, let's have a look under the hood because that's less boring oh, God, what is this I swear to God, stuff just drops on the cars all the time cleaning it off I also like you don't have to release it from the inside so okay anyway here it is here is a 351 Cleveland Cobra jet engine uh, you know, as much of a Cobra jet as you're going to get in 1973 anyway. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a little bit of a debate as to whether this is a big block or a small block. Some people say it's a mid block uh, or that big and small block is more of a GM thing. Uh, there's the 351 Windsor, which is a variation of the 302, uh, which, um, you know, this has... <sighs> Maybe more the 72 than the, you know, this is all the hyper technical stuff that just is tedious. But apparently, this has the heads, or at least the 72 version did, from the Boss 302. So uh, the four barrel heads were a little bit more free flowing uh, than the uh, two barrel heads. Uh, the most interesting engine choices came in 71. There was no doubt. You could get a 302 in it, uh, you could get the 351 two barrel, a 351 four barrel. Uh, and uh, then the 429 Cobra Jet was also available. Uh, the next year they dumped the uh, Cobra Jet, the 429 version, and the 302 and just went with three different 351s. Uh, two, uh, well, one two barrel and two four barrels. For this year, 73, there were basically two engines. There was the 351 uh, two barrel putting out under 200 horse. Uh, in 72, they switched from gross horsepower to net horsepower. Uh, that's why you got all these giant horsepower ratings from muscle cars in the past. Uh, you know, they were measuring the horsepower basically at the flywheel. Uh, California wanted it all measured at the rear wheels instead, uh, and they were doing it that way. And, and the auto industry just standardized it in 1972 and everything went from gross horsepower to net so uh, this has net 264 horsepower which is pretty damn good for the time and probably would have been like 325 or more if they had done it in the old-fashioned way like they did the year before uh, but again it's a pretty rare setup I'm gonna call it a Q code big block because <laughs> that's what they uh, called it when I bought it and uh, you know people can I mean if you apparently I looked around four last night if you want to get Ford guys in a fist fight uh, you know it's like asking what about abortion in a crowd of people uh, you know just ask you know is the 351 Cleveland a big block or a small block and watch chaos ensue uh, it's just fascinating but uh, it is what it is and we're gonna go with it uh, it's nice also to see the air conditioning in this thing which is just fantastic with the four speed and the Cobra jet engine and uh, I think it just looks all terrific under there so um, a pretty neat setup uh, and again that four speed is is a very interesting unit it was the last year that they used what they call the top loader four speed and uh, they call it a top loader because the access panel for it where you work on it is on the top of it rather than on the side as it is with most and you know, most other Ford speeds it was a, a Ford produced unit it was kind of uh, it replaced some Borg Warner four speed and actually is a pretty famous pretty durable pretty cool four 
four-speed transmission that was used in a variety, like over a hundred models in the Ford lineup, including some of their Halo cars, like the Shelby Mustangs and the Boss 302, and even the Cobras uh, used uh, top loader four speeds. A lot of racing applications. They're just considered to be a very good, very bulletproof four-speed transmission. And uh, I think it's neat that this car got the last of them before they were replaced with something else. So, uh, and again, 250 or so of these Cougars came with that, uh, which I think is just cool. Also, a Ford 9-inch rear end with the track lock, so it'll leave two big black marks if you do posi burnouts in the Walmart parking lot. Uses leaf springs in the rear, uses uh, coils up front, and, uh, you know, it's as good as the Mustang, basically. Uh, has pretty good road manners, pretty good handling, and goes down the road very, very nice. So... All right, there it is. And now I'm going to pause again for a minute to get my crap in the back. And uh, that way we can just hop in the interior, have a look in there, and go for a spin. All right, so I had to pull back here to get out of the sun, which is fine. And uh, let's just have a look inside this thing. I do love those swoopy door lines, I have to say. So there you have the original. Uh, this is more or less an original car. This thing has never been restored. Uh, it's uh, It's been painted. It's had a paint job for sure. Uh, but what they did was take a nice original Survivor and just put a really nice proper paint job on it. The interior is as it came. Under the hood is as it came. Uh, it looks like they might have polished up the air cleaner, but that's about it. But all in all, this is a nice original Survivor car. And uh, whoever owned it definitely put a little bit of money into the drivetrain because it drives like a million bucks. I think they probably put those wheels on it. Uh, they put the steering wheel on it, which I have to say I'm not a fan of. I imagine the original wheel had some cracks in it, which they were uh, pretty common at the time. Uh, I looked up this wheel, and it is expensive. It's one you buy from one of these uh, Cougar restoration shops, but I think it may look more fitting on the prior gen Cougar. Uh, just not a big fan of it, but it is nice to grip. It's a nice big polished wood wheel, and uh, the hell with it. It is going to be there, so if uh, you, know, you buy this car and want to change that, you can. Uh, I do like the nice big high bucket seats. They've got uh, Cougar logos in them, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, back seats, your Canadians, they're going to be fairly chipper, although the guy in the middle, uh, if you can fit one in there, is going to have a little bit of a drivetrain hump up his rump, so uh, that's a bit unfortunate, but otherwise, a nice place to sit back, enjoy a doobie, listen to some Led Zeppelin, and uh, head off to the uh, Aerosmith concert, so uh, everyone's going to be chipper back there. Gun storage in the back, eh, not really. Nothing going on that I can see. And the package shelf, that's nah, no good. You're going to have to put your infants in the trunk. Uh, there are some ashtrays, because of course people smoked back then. So you've got ashtrays on both sides. You've got, uh, again, these little quarter windows that go up and yeah, all very nice stuff. Uh, door panel wise, probably some cracks here. It looks like they stitched a panel over the top of it, which uh, works fine. Uh, you got window cranks, you got vents down there, which are probably speakers behind them. Uh, you got a little Cougar logo, you got your uh, remote control for the mirror, and a uh, very interesting big molded door panel, I have to say. And uh, interesting material, very, very 70s, very bronzy, brownie, goldy, all the stuff that was going on at the time. Okay, being an XR7, I do believe you get some full gauges, which are nice. So you've got your uh, fuel gauge over here. You do have a low fuel idiot light. Uh, you got a tack, which is great. Uh, you know, nice to see that bouncing around. You got 120 mile an hour speedo. There you see 92 on the clock. Uh, those are original miles on the car. Uh, you got a temp gauge over here. You've got your uh, amp gauge and your oil pressure gauge. So the car does have nice full gauges. Uh, you do also have air conditioning vents all around and a light switch down here. Uh, over here you've got your wipers, you've got your lighter, you've got these fascinating little accessory lights here. So uh, let me close the door and see if those work. So courtesy lights, I click that rocker switch and on they come. So that's kind of cool. Uh, map light, there it is. Okay, so we've got a map light that comes on. And uh, what's this one? Accessory. 
accessory isn't doing a damn thing and it feels like more of a momentary switch than a rocker. Uh, here's the AM8 track and damn it I forgot to bring 8 tracks with me. Uh, there is a uh, AC uh, control unit beneath that. Uh, here's that fantastic 4 speed center console uh, with the clock in front of it. Uh, you got a little slide back ashtray here. You got a center console right here. Nice stuff. You got a um, glove box over here with a big oh shit handle for the 351 Cleveland and uh, everyone's going to be pretty chipper. Uh, you also have some uh, sun visors. Nice stuff. Somebody put a mirror on that one and uh, everything looking good. So, all right, let's fire this thing up and go for a spin. <laughs> it does come to life with a pretty menacing roar, I have to say. Uh, I think whoever had, I mean, it had dual exhaust from the factory, but I think there's been a couple of turbo mufflers added on for effect because that has a very, very growly sound with the, uh, it was a hotter cam in the uh, four barrel, so you do have a little bit of cam lope, but definitely more uh, exhaust note than you would have got from the factory. All right, let's go for a spin. Everything's always harder one-handed. Man, I tell you what, on these old cars, like big V8, and oh, look at that, there he is. He was just waiting. Yeah, this is a Cougar too. Anyway, glad he didn't show up while we were outside. Uh, on these old American V8 rear drive cars, there is something about having a manual gearbox in them that absolutely heightens the joy that you get from driving them. Uh, the clutch in this one feels nice and light, surprisingly. I was expecting to have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to push it, but it's surprisingly light. And uh, it's kind of a joy to shift, I have to say. Uh, the car goes down the road nice, and the way it feels with the gearbox, with the manual gearbox, is such an enhancement over how it feels with an automatic. Uh, the first time I realized that was driving C4 Corvettes. Uh, when you get one that had the stick in it, it was just so much more fun. And uh, the same can be said of this car. I know Dalton's windshield is shit. Let's see when we turn the corner. such a sweet feeling and a sweet gearbox. Uh, I was so surprised. I thought it would be much more clunky, uh, much tougher to shift, but it's absolute butter and uh, a real joy to operate. And man, does it feel cool. And <laughs> a nice menacing growl. And again, 73, kind of the final year of... Um, the final year before the malaise hit. Yeah, people with their Christmas shit out. Uh, God bless them. You know, what the hell was... What the hell was that thing? Some kind of giant deflated Christmas bear. God, there's nothing sadder than a deflated air ornament. Holy shit. Uh -huh. Let's see if we can get a hot start out of this thing as long as we're here. Yeah, I tell you, it sure feels pretty big blocky to me. I mean, that was half throttle, and it just had a really lovely, big, heavy growl uh, that does remind me of the, uh, of the big blocks in the GM cars. up here and go through the gears again real quick and uh, and see what we got. One weird thing, this car has to be in reverse to take the key out. It seemed like more of a sob thing than a mercury thing to me.
absolutely love it. And therein lies the joy. I mean, if you have this thing in drive in an automatic, uh, it's just not as much fun. But I mean, in this car, every stoplight, every stop sign, every time you're in and out of traffic, you have this opportunity to have fun playing around with the shifter. You can go into a third gear, get a little bit more revs. Yeah, it just makes the car more fun to drive for sure. So anyway, there it is. This is a 1973 uh, Mercury Cougar XR7 hardtop. Uh, this one has the 351 Cobra jet engine. Pretty sweet piece. Four-speed top loader. Nine-inch Ford rear with track lock. Uh, it's about as hot a setup as you're going to get uh, in a 1973 Cougar. That's for damn sure. Uh, this one is going to be for sale at Auto House in Naples. I don't know if it will be up on the website today, uh, but uh, we'll try to get the video up today. Get it to pump the revs up. Somehow it gets into this really big drone, right about 2,000 RPMs. That's hard to, hard to over talk. Um, yeah, so there it is. I got a lot more fun stuff coming up. There's a lot more cars on the horizon. Uh, let me just again take a minute to thank everybody who watches these things, who subscribes, who makes comments. I read everyone. I love them. Uh, I just absolutely am kept going by you guys, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, the people who really do watch these things. And God help you, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So thank you very much for having a look today, and uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.